Okay, so let's begin now. You go ahead and ask me what was the first question. So before this, um, Dallas prepared us a list of questions. Um, so, so Dallas already prepared a list of questions. I'm calling it the 10 Australian questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first question is that, um, Rumiche, can you tell us about your teachers, especially um, Hando Samuel Hanze Momo? So talk about uh, my teachers. So let me begin with, uh, um, so let me begin like this. So I have something called my mind heart teachers. And by saying mind heart, I mean the ones that I have uh, irreversible faith in. I have one pointed devotion, uh, extremely uh, deep love. And those teachers are, uh, of course, my grandfather is what is uh, Jade Rinpoche, Peno uh, Rinpoche, and uh, the 16th Karmapa. I call them my mind heart teachers. Now, as far as uh, the others are concerned, uh, I will begin with my own father, his uh, uh, eminence, don't say, Shenpindao Rinpoche. So he wants me to talk about them. Yeah, well, especially Samuel Especially Samuel Okay, so. Pala, let me see, what can I say about Pala? He was a very unconventional sort of a teacher. Sometimes uh, back then when I was with him and he used to teach or when he used to lead by example, some of the teachings and his ways used to, from my point of view, it, it felt like it contradicted things he would say. Like he would say one thing one minute and the next thing he would change everything up. So back then I was not fortunate enough to understand the ways, but I always felt that there was like a contradiction which was not true. It was just my own uh, limited knowledge and having no understanding of the teachings. So it was done in a way, I realize now that it was done. So in order for us that we can um, get the realization of impermanence, but back then to, my, to, to me, uh, it felt like it was a contradiction. So it was completely my fault. As I said, he was very unconventional. He loved to confuse you, but this confusion had a purpose because you, when you are confused, you want to straighten out the confusion. You want to kind of devil like deep uh, within to find the answer to that confusion. So he would say things that would confuse you. And then we had to kind of figure out and swim through that confusion, but it made us more um, sort of uh, more uh, understanding, more open. It it kind of uh, we gained experience from it. Um, it's pointing out your faults. Not exactly pointing out your faults, but pointing out your limitations and the understanding and your misconceptions actually, your misconceptions and things like that. So it was back then. I thought it was confusion, but it was basically breaking our misconceptions regarding 
uh, the Dharma in general, but life also as well. Uh, he was down to earth, uh, very devoted to the lineage. Um, he, he was very um, diligent in making sure that the uh, authentic uh, teachings uh, were preserved and propagated. And he didn't like having a huge crowd to teach. And he always made sure that it was always a small, this was done on purpose to make sure that it was uh, done with a small group so that he could reach out to everyone so that he could clear up their misunderstanding if they had any to help them with the confusion or even to help them on a one-to-one -one basis. And that's why he always kept it like a small group. And that was done on purpose. Loved telling us dirty jokes. I'm not gonna even repeat it here. <laughs> Loved <laughs> such dirty jokes I've never heard in my life. But uh, uh, and then another thing that uh, Rinpoche would do is he would do them, he would do and say the most inappropriate things at times. Back then I thought it was inappropriate, but then again, when given the opportunity now to reflect and contemplate, and I just realized he was, it was a teaching disguised as being inappropriate, but I'm not gonna go into details there. <clears throat> and what else? Ah, oh, my other teachers, right. <clears throat> Another teacher that I, I learned from and had the opportunity to, to receive a lot of teachings from was Dungse uh, Pende Nobula Rinpoche. He was also one of the sons of His Holiness Dungse Rinpoche, my uncle. Uh, he was in the monastic system, so what do you call it? The monastic, uh, what monastic. do you call it? When you have a, anyways, he was in the monastic sort of a system and he left that to become a lay practitioner because he got married a very kind, very noble, uh, down to earth again, no pretension at all, uh, a very, very good artist. So I learned my handwriting from him in particular, my handwriting, my Tibetan script handwriting, but then just having the opportunity to observe him, uh, to be with him, uh, I gained a lot of insight and a lot of uh, experience uh, so to speak, regarding the Dharma. So that's one, another unconventional teacher that I had was somebody named Tukut Seppel. Once again, he was one of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong, but I believe he was one of the high Mindaling Tukus. He too left uh, the monastic, I say the system because I, I, I don't know what the word it is, but I, I don't know if it's a monastic community or system. He left that to serve his holiness, Dinju Rinpoche. So from Mindrilling, he left and he traveled a lot with Dinju Rinpoche and, and he also was very unconventional. Now, I uh, don't need to get into, you know, these days, uh, you know, uh, we are talking about, uh, we always talk about the divine mad monk. And he was like that in a way, like a crazy wisdom sort of a person. And <clears throat> he, he was so down to earth that people never realized how learned and how, what a beautiful person he was. So they took a lot of advantage of him, but on his Pari Nirvana, when he entered Pari Nirvana, he left a lot of signs and realizing that the people had regret, but then that also was a very important teaching moment for me. I realized that appearances are not everything and well, yep, that's what I can, as far as Tukut Seppel is concerned, I'll leave it at that. And now coming to Samuel Hanzala. Samuel Hanzala, uh, if you do not know, was the incarnation of Namgyal Doma. That was his holiness, Dinjurumbuche's mother. And it is said that while she was in her mother's stomach, his holiness already recognized her, but he was sad because he said, oh, I don't have much time left. But however, because of a deep love for me and that she's come here, so, and uh, Holiness Jun Rinpoche and Samuel Hanzala, although she was his granddaughter, they had a relationship of a father and son, um, a father and daughter, sorry, not son, <laughs> father and daughter. And Samuel Hanzala also, you could even say like a mother and son, 
kind of a relationship. So what kind of a person was she? Wrathful, very, very wrathful, but so loving and so kind. And uh, she was the embodiment of kindness. Uh, kindness, she was the embodiment of compassion. We all talk about what Dakinis are and what how they should be and what they should act like or be like. And then Samuel Hanzala was it. She was the embodiment of a Dakini in every sense of the word. However, she had a wrathful form. And uh, she was also, I can say, a hidden practitioner. So I won't get into that since the word here is hidden. Uh, but a loyal person, a loving person, as I said, loved cats, uh, loved the elderly people, and had so much wisdom, so much wisdom. Just being in her presence was just a privilege and it was just amazing. Uh, it was very difficult to explain when you are in the presence of a holy being such as herself. There is this thing that they radiate you, so we, we, I can call it love, you can call it compassion, you can call it something noble, but they have this thing that they radiate that you just want to absorb and just be in the presence. They don't even have to say a word. You just want to sit with them and, you know, kind of radiate and be in that moment with them. So she was that kind of person. Mm -hmm. Stories when someone's love cry every day for Oh, I was going to get to that in the devotion part, but yes. Samal Hanzala was very devoted to holiness, Dinka uh, Rinpoche. You know, I've, I served her for the last 25 years, if I'm mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, it's 25 years or so uh, until she ent entered Puri Nirvana. And every day, there wasn't a single day that wouldn't go by where she wouldn't cry. Just looking at the photo of His Holiness Dinka Rinpoche, or even if I was looking through Facebook and by mistake, I put the sound on and of his holiness in the room, which he's teaching just the sound of his voice that she would cry. So seeing that devotion was just amazing, just amazing, undescribable. She saw everything. Hmm. She saw everything. Which one? She saw everything when she passed away. You want me to tell that also? Okay, he insists I tell you that aspect as well. The depth of her kindness was when holiness, uh, thank you, Rachel, that's I think very important to know. When Dinjum Rinpoche entered Parin in Nirvana, she sold everything and offered it to Tsok. And I mean, down to her last dollar, she sold her jewelry. She sold all the important things that she had and offered that for the 49 days of his holiness. And that's the kind of person she was. I mean, literally we say, someone who gives the shirt off the back for others, that, that would be Samal Hansen. But it was also done without anyone knowing. For example, one minute she would be angry at someone and you know she would be at the fish and she would just give them the worst scolding that they have ever received in their lives. And then at the another moment at the back when the scolding was done, she would come back and she said, I wanted to uh, sponsor a puja for this person. You know, I need to help him. And then she would sponsor a puja for the person. And that person would never know. And all they would think is, oh, Tanzila is so wrathful. She's, she's been so mean to me, but never realizing, never realizing that how kind she was. So uh, as far as Tanzila is concerned, I think I will uh, leave it at that for now. And I'll get to her again later on as we go down the list of questions. What's up, so the second question is, um, can you, Rumi can you please describe an experience in your life that taught you the value of devotion to spiritual practice? Uh, say that again. Um, can you uh, please describe an experience in your life that an taught experience you, that taught you an experience value, or experiences? And, um, experience or experiences. Okay. Um, that taught you the value of devotion to spiritual practice. Value of devotion. Okay. Uh, so if by devotion, if you are talking about uh, devotion as in receiving blessings, always trying to make merit, uh, doing prostrations, offering prayers, being in the Dharma, sort of like making pilgrimages, offering the butter lamps and things like that. Honestly, uh, I was just uh, okay Buddhist. Not to say I didn't have deep devotion, but I, I had 
devotion, but I wouldn't say something called irreversible devotion or one-pointed devotion to the Dharma because I had a Western uh, education. I went to St. Paul's, I went to the, as um, he mentioned earlier, I went to St. Paul's and I went to the Baha'i International School. And even though I was aware that uh, I was recognized as a reincarnation of uh, Polong Sangi Rinpoche, but honestly speaking, I didn't have that deep devotion for the Dharma. This would develop much later on. In fact, as recent as I would say, maybe three years or two years, two years ago, and there were two uh, important uh, incidences that happened. One was the uh, uh, Pala entering Parinirvana Pala, meaning father, Pala in Tibetan is father, my father uh, entering Parinirvana, uh, seeing the, having the privilege of, you know, uh, being able to handle his kudung through all the 49 days and then seeing uh, him leave such a miraculous sign like the Tukja change some the eyes tongue and uh, heart rolled into one, which was of course um, uh, discovered by none other than the, the Tibetan Yangtze. So I would say the re my real sense of devotion was uh, it occurred then. And it was cemented a year later when Semal Hanzala entered Parin Nirvana. Now I'm not saying because of the miracles and things like that. It's just because I had the privilege of witnessing things that uh, I will not go into details, but say for instance, uh, the year that Semal Hanzala was, uh, she was, uh, uh, let me go back and actually talk about the year before when she was sick, Hanzala, had uh, what you call that uh, sepsis of the blood, blood poisoning, is it? If I'm not mistaken, one, uh, two years before she entered Pari Nirvana. And back then, I was so um, in a state of panic and uh, wondering what was going to happen. And she told me back then, she said, You don't worry, because she was in the emergency room for 15 days. She said, Don't worry, I will come through, I'll make it through this. You don't have to worry. It's, my time has not come as yet. And so, you know, true enough, she recovered. But then as far as I was concerned, I just put that to her having confidence. But then the last year of her life, uh, six months or even one year before she entered Pari Nirvana, she said to me, and not just to me, actually, this, she said to uh, the inner circle that would be Marcos Frey and myself, she said, next year, I will not make it. Uh, I'm not going to live it seems my my life is coming to a to an end. It's time for me to leave this body. So she said, I need you to start preparing uh, uh, certain things that I, I want fulfilled and preparing for them so that it all materializes. And I thought to myself, uh, perhaps uh, maybe she was going through, you know, like a period of, I wouldn't say melancholy, but maybe reflection and thinking because of, uh, but th this was a time COVID hadn't happened, by the way. So I uh, basically, uh, it's fair to say that I, I didn't uh, fully believe that this would happen. And then, you know, she started getting sick. Uh, I think month by month, she started getting weaker and weaker and weaker. And then as the last three months were coming to a close, she said to me, one day she got up and she said, I have to do a I have to do a puja, she said, a prayer. Uh, this is the last prayer that I need. Uh, Dakini sort of appeared to her in a white dress, she told me. And she said, they said to do the sukha that we always do, the Dharmapala protector prayer. And this is the last prayer that I need. So when Hansala said, this is the last prayer that I need, I assumed she was talking about that this was the last prayer and then she would get better. So, let me leave this story aside, because then it'll get confusing. Anyways, then uh, making a long story short, there was a Trima Puja that was coming up also at, at the same time. So I asked her, is it possible for me to do the Dharmapala Puja after the Trima Puja? And she said, that's perfectly all right. But then three days before we did the Trima Puja, she got seriously ill. 
and she refused to go to the emergency. And by then she was, uh, there was again sepsis of the blood. It was the blood poisoning. And I, uh, from, from now, after going through what I went through, I realized it was like the organs failing because of the blood contamination in the blood. And she refused to go to the emergency. She said, at first, I want you to finish the trauma. And then only if you finish the trauma, I will go into the hospital. So on the last day, we did the trauma puja. And then we rushed someone Hansala to the hospital. By then, she was not uh, herself. She, she was a little bit, uh, uh, she couldn't speak or walk properly. But however, she recovered enough in the emergency room uh, enough so that she called me in and she said to me, she said, uh, my time has come, she said, but I'm going to wait for the Dinyu Yangtze, that's the Tibetan Dinyu Yangtze to come. I, I need to see him before I leave. So once again, I thought to myself, well, I mean, I don't know how Dinyu Yangtze is going to make it. And then the doctors were telling me she has to be rushed to the emergency uh, and into the ICU immediately and she said listen i am not going to die until i meet the new young yangsi and of course there are other stories i could add in but i'm not going to do that right now a long story short she was in the icu for 45 days and finally the new yangsi did come and then when he met her uh, he whispered something in her ear i don't know what it is i've never asked new yangsi what he told her and as the people here know, the very next day, after 45 days, she entered Parinirvana. That was another fact that kind of sealed the devotion that I was feeling. Then I realized, uh, because I asked Hansela once, I remember I asked Hansela once, why is it that when great beings die that they have to perform miracles, like leave Tukja Chensom and things like that? I said, I thought, that wasn't needed. And she said, no, you don't understand. And Hansel was very blunt, very blunt. I remember she called me, you stupid idiot. She said, you don't understand. There's no need to leave any signs and things like that. She said, but if we don't leave signs and things like that, how are people going to develop devotion? You know, and that is the only reason she said that we need to leave signs and things like that. It's because we have to assure the people, you know, that there's something beyond death and that the death is not the end. And how you transition from this, the bardo of death is because of the Dharma and that's why we have to leave signs and we should leave signs, I remember that. And then the rest, as you all know, or maybe you haven't heard, but then she left a lot of signs. She stayed in Tukdam, she stayed in Tukdam for 17 days in a meditative state. She left a lot of ring cells, the white rainbows. Uh, rainbows every other day, rainbows, her favorite color, moon bows at night, rainbows at night. And, and from then, from then, I would say that my, I started realizing certain things, certain aspects, and that is how my devotion developed. I, I know we always say don't, you should not look at miracles because you then miss the essential point of the Dharma. But the way Hansela explained it to me is we leave signs so that we can have confidence in the Dharma and confidence in knowing that the Dharma works. And that's, that's, that I would say, and again, so many stories, if I go on, I can be here whole day and tell you what sealed the deal, but so to speak, that is it. Did I over talk now? <laughs> <laughs> I guess the more the better. Uh, so I guess uh, we'll move on to the third question. Um, so here's, um, can you please explain uh, what is Guru Yoga and what is the point of it? Okay, so let's, let's make that into two questions. Okay. So what is Guru Yoga? So let me see from my so I'm going to go off script sometimes. I've written some notes. Guru Yoga, so see, Guru Yoga, what is it? We all know the definition of it. It is the mingling of our uh, mind with our Lama's mind. It is in the union, or we can say, because there's not a good English word that could describe it, but let's just say the mingling of our mind 
with that of our Lama or that of the deity. Uh, it is a very profound practice. It has a lot of variations in our Tibetan tradition, especially in authentic practices, actually. And basically, as I said before, it's the merging of our practitioners' mainstream with that of the guru's uh, body, speech, and mind. And what's the second question? And what is the point? So I guess the purpose. Of point of it. The point of it is, Dunju Rinpoche has said, he said, for a genuine realization to be born within a mind stream, you have to dedicate your energy to Guru Yoga and take that as the life and heart of your practice. So we all, of course, want to be enlightened or we all want to awaken, we all want to reach a state of realization. So without Guru Yoga, there is no realization according to the Tantras or according to, let me just speak for Dinjum Tessar in particular, what His Holiness says. So there is no realization without Guru Yoga, but of course, Guru Yoga has to be based on Bodhicitta as well, because without Bodhicitta, without the attitude of the Bodhicitta or the intent of the Bodhicitta, there can be no Guru Yoga. It is because of the Bodhicitta, seeing how beings are suffering, seeing how we want to get enlightened so that we can free others from suffering so they can also reach the same state. That's why we do this profound practice of Guru Yoga. Of course, again, the Rumashi also says one of the most profound practices of all the 84,000 methods of Lord Buddha's teaching is the realization of uh, bodhicitta. And of course, the life and heart of your practice should be Guru Yoga. And that is the point. So basically, we are linking our own Buddha nature with the Buddha nature of if you have a spiritual teacher, then that's what it is. And then we gain the inspiration for us to realize our own Buddha nature and not just realize our own Buddha nature, but in uh, practice to actualize it and to see its potential. And so this is the whole point of Guru Yoga. That's if you want to awaken. If you don't want to awaken, then there's no need to do Guru Yoga. And it's my favorite yoga because I don't have to move my body. As you can see, I don't like movement. So <laughs> then. Um, so the fourth question is, um, what qualities do we need to have in order to practice Guru Yoga? Qualities, ah, as I said, qualities, the only quality, whether you're a bad person or you're a good person, once you've made a commitment to enter the Tantras or the Vajra, Vajrayana, uh, the only quality you need is the quality of the bodhicitta, the bodhicitta intention. It's very simple. Uh, people may say so otherwise and read thousands and thousands of texts to you or what kind of qualities is needed. But simply put, you need the bodhicitta intention. Once you have the bodhicitta intention, the rest will follow. And that's all you need, basically. It doesn't need to be complicated. At least from my experience, it doesn't need to be complicated. If your teacher says it has to be complicated, then make sure you do it the complicated way. Depends on what your teacher says. For me, and at least for my crew here at Yishin Empire, I always tell them simplicity is the best way to go forward because sometimes when you delve is it, into a high teachings such as the Dzogchen teachings and all, there's always a danger, always a danger of uh, attachment to that those teachings. And when you attach to anything, including even if it's the Dharma, you get attached to it. And then you get lost in the view. When you get lost in the view is no more Dzogchen because all the people love Dzogchen. They love receiving Dzogchen teachings. They love doing Dzogchen practices. And you know, some people love reading about Dzogchen and then they gain this knowledge. And when they gain this knowledge, they get attached to that, uh, attached to that state of, uh, ego and then we don't realize it is due to the ego we get attached to these things and we say oh i know so many things oh i'm much more intelligent than him then we love correcting other people's mistakes and it all derives from ego and that's why simplicity in practice is so important sometimes complicated things can be made simple and that was one of the most beautiful thing about dinu rumbache was he was able to simplify a lot of dharmas so that 
each and every person according to their own capacity would be able to receive the teachings, not just receive, but understand, and not just understand, but actualize it. Is that it? I went out of the okay, uh, then... So the next question is, um, so then how do we start Guru Yoga practice? Um, I guess, how is it actually done? How is it actually done? How do we start Guru Yoga practice? Hmm. Now there are, uh, there are, I can say five ways, Anyways, for now, let's say, let's keep it at three. How's Guru Yoga done? Very, very simple. Uh, we request the blessings. We recite the prayers. Means after having received the blessings, we recite the prayers. And then we meditate on the Guru, whereby, as you all know, it dissolves within us. So it's called the outer inner and the secret. And that is all that we have to be concerned with as uh, lay practitioners. And if you want to go higher, you can go to the innermost secret, then you can go to the unsuppressible innermost secret. But that is for a scholar to describe to all of you or to show you the way for me. I'm not a scholar and I don't claim to be a scholar, so I cannot get into that. I may just mislead you all. So how do we start it? Very simple again, it's bodhicitta, 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 and then you request the blessings, you receive the blessings, you do the recitation of the prayers. Once you do the recitation of the prayers, you do the visualization where you meditate on the guru and you become indivisible with the guru's mind. That's really like, it's not only like just reciting. For me, oh, guru yoga, for me, it's not just about uh, visualizing and things like that. It's also, there's so many ways we can practice guru yoga. Sometimes, you know, when we go out and we see a food that we love or that we'd love to eat before we eat it, we just offer it to a guru that in itself for me is like guru yoga also, offering things that we love, offering things that we cherish and things like that. So yeah, in that- always, yeah. Like when you always ask us to, you know, offer some alandala before. Oh, that, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, exactly. Just as even when there's good food or something, even now I set out, set aside a small offering for someone Hansla to place it in front of her. You know, things like that. Guru yoga can be practiced within and it can also be translated. Now, if your teacher says it cannot be done, then please, you have to make sure you listen to your teacher. But from my own experience, I've also realized that we can also actualize this practice, not just within, but also we can translate externally also, so when you do this, you create a habitual tendency to practice what you practice within and to translate it outside to actualize the practice. <laughs> okay, so the sixth question is, um, how do we know when we have met our guru? How do we know when we have met our guru? Good question. I don't have an answer for that. But uh, you know, the well, the well, according to the books or according to the teachings, it says some say perhaps wait three years, three days, three years or three months and three days, like a retreat to see the teacher if he's qualified or not. And there are many variations. Uh, many different teachings, how to recognize a guru, but personally speaking, those things, as I said, no, I didn't say it to you all, but I said it to Quark before, this didn't work for me. I, I mean, waiting three years, three months, who knows about waiting tomorrow if you die, <laughs> then it would have all been in vain. Who can wait three years? For me, I realized that uh, when you're in the presence of someone and that someone motivates you to be a very good person, to be loving, to be kind, to be compassionate, to better yourself. Uh, they, they make you want to contemplate on your shortcomings, to, to, you know, to purify your, your uh, three the three poisons, maybe whether it's greed, anger, jealousy, or even aversion, you know, things like that. Somebody who wants to make you want to be a better human being, that's the kind of person that should be your guru, someone that you you feel will protect you, you know, will not let you down. Uh, that's that's been my experience of 
of recognizing our guru. That's how I recognize, that's how I actually accepted Samuel Hanzala to be my guru, my guru, guru because that, that's how I felt. Uh, you know, someone that doesn't judge you, you know, they, they accept you for who you are and they just make you open to everything, you know, you, and they, they skillfully, uh, kindly, they dissolve all your misconceptions that you may have. They make you feel open. Protected. Hmm? Feel protected. Yeah, feel protected. Definitely, that's the most important thing. A guru must make you, you must make you feel protected or must protect you. So you feel confidence, not just in yourself. You have confidence in the Dharma. You have confidence in the teaching. That is how I know that one should uh, recognize your guru. Uh, I can Google it and send you a link <laughs> if you want, but I'm just, just uh, based on my own experience, that's what I feel it should be in a guru. I, I understand. And of course, this is being recorded, isn't it? So if I, of course this is being recorded. So if I say, you know, I don't believe in that uh, reading for three years, kind of a thing to look for the qualities of a guru, I may get crucified online. <laughs> but you know what it is. If you, if you, another important thing regarding finding your guru is don't just read about your guru because you have to understand that books written on Rinpoche's, whoever it is, there's, there's a book and this is, this is a shameless plug in. There's a, my life story is also coming out, but I'll let you all know it's with others. <laughs> but don't just read what's written about Rinpoche's and all, because you have to understand that this is the, because we all have different perceptions, right? We all are habituated uh, and conditioned by different circumstances. So our perception is not the same as somebody else's perception. So somebody else may write a book on how beautiful and loving and kind a Rinpoche is. That's their experience. Maybe that's their karma, karmic link. And that is how they perceive them. Or that person may have the most highest or pure perception. And you go to that Rinpoche and he may say something like, you asshole, and that would devastate you. So don't, I, I hear a lot of people, oh, I read about this Rinpoche and he's so kind and I heard about him. No, if you feel that some Rinpoche is a, a material good enough to be your root guru or you are thinking of asking him to be your guru, then you must make an effort to go and be with that guru, to see him, to observe him, you know, to see from your own experience if it helps. Now I know in the Dharma, some people say that Dharma is not all about the warm feeling, fuzzy feeling inside. It also turns their life upside down and things like that. But as far as a guru is concerned, that for me, that didn't apply. When you see your guru, you'll finally realize that you have found your mother, you have found your father, you have found your friend, you have found your sister, your brother, everything, everything in that guru, you will gain that realization when you meet him. And so when you feel all of those things that he's a family, a friend, a protector, then you accept him as a guru, but it's very difficult to say really. But from my experience, this is... You usually mention like it doesn't happen I mean, it depends on a certain situation that happens, but like it doesn't happen on just day one. Are you usually on day one? No, nothing no. happens on day one. Just don't go on day one and see a Rinpoche and say, oh my Lord, I have found my guru, root guru. Should never do that. That is an emotional uh, acting on your emotions, not on day one. You've got to spend some time with the Lama or whoever it is, get to know them. You know, not just on day one. And day one, just don't drop to your knees. Don't ever do that. And another important thing is, if he's a genuine guru, he will, he will never, never, never get upset when you, when he says something that goes against your sense of reasoning and you question him. And that's important. A guru should be able to answer things that you may have, uh, you may feel uh, unreasonable. You know, I was saying that time, like to quack, you know, if you say he accepts me as a guru 
and he's my student. If I tell him to jump and he jumps off the bridge and dies, I'll say, what a stupid idiot. But if I tell him to jump and he says, why the shit should I jump? What do I gain from it? Then I know I've done my job. So yeah, but I don't know why I'm talking about that though. <laughs> 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 it's something to do with the group. I don't know why I'm talking about that. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, um, so what if we don't have a teacher or our teacher has passed away then, you know, how, how do we practice Guru Yoga then? Well, if you understand that the mind of all the teachers are from one and the same, then that shouldn't be an issue for you. So whether you choose the karma to what was the question to be a guru is it? Uh, no, no, like what if we don't have a have a teacher? Or oh, if you don't have a teacher, away, or your teacher passes away, how do we practice guru yoga? Your teacher never passes away. One thing he's always there with you. If you have practiced guru yoga, he's forever there in your mind stream. And anyways, your teacher's mind is the mind of the Buddha. The mind of the Buddha is the mind of your teacher. And in fact, good news that your teacher's mind is your mind, one and the same. It all comes from one mind. So you have a lot of uh, options to, to choose from, uh, whether it is the 16th Karmapa, 17th Karmapa, whoever it is, this, it's, 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 uh, and if not, you have also the deities that you can uh, meditate on. So yeah, there's no, 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 no need to panic, no need to panic. <laughs> And there's so many reincarnations happening, so no, no, no need to panic. Yes, so, <laughs> I guess it's a, a spicy question. Um, the question is, uh, what advice would you give for those who become worried or afraid of Guru Yoga because of all the abuse scandals? One should never be afraid of the Guru Yoga, because Guru Yoga is a realization that cannot be stained by anyone, by anyone or anything. So don't be afraid of the Guru Yoga, be afraid of the Guru. That's what it is. But don't be afraid of the Guru Yoga. So what's the question? Uh, like, so what advice would you give to them? Like, because I guess because of hearing these abusive scandals, you know, they might have, a, you know, a different perception of Guru Yoga, you know? So if, okay, so if you, if you, if you're a, if you're a, say a beautiful Dakini and you hear this Lama is always molesting girls, always molesting women and things like that. Then if you go to that Lama, then that's your own stupidity. And that has nothing to do with Guru Yoga. But for the sake of Guru Yoga, you go to that Lama, then that's your stupidity. But then on the other hand, it is the Lama's fault too, because he is supposed to protect the ones who come to seek ref refuge from him. We as Oh God, this is alien to me. I have never referred to myself as a Rinpoche. We as Rinpoches, whatever it is, or Lamas, call us whatever you want. When people come to seek refuge, what is the first priority for us? Protection, love, and compassion to those who seek refuge, to make sure that they stay on the path, to make sure that the, they are not destroyed because of the path, because Vajrayana is not a joke. As you know, Vajrayana means either you sink or swim. And that's what it is, Vajrayana. And therefore it becomes the duty of all those lamas, those who give refuge to people. The first thing is, important thing is, of course, I can, as I said, bodhicitta, because of bodhicitta, we extend our love and protection, not just to them, those who seek refuge, but to all sentient beings. So, and I said that and I completely forgot the question. What was the question? Uh, what advice would you give for those who become wary or oh and okay yes so because... don't worry if you feel a particular lama is abusive and things like that you have a it's like a buffet the vajrayana you know you have fat lamas like me you have thin lamas like i won't mention who you have medium-sized lamas you have anorexic lamas you have bulimic lamas also the thing i'm saying is we are all not perfect if you're going to go in seeking perfection in the Lama, then that's your expectations and you'll be highly disappointed because not all aspects of the Lama can be perfect. We are all 
because of our choice of being reborn here as human in the human realm, there are some imperfections. Now, some lamas may say, I am perfect. It's your view that is wrong. Then I call that, that bullshit. Because as human beings, we all have some aspects of our life that was perfect. If I was perfect, I wouldn't be this fat. I would like have a beach body. I'd be somewhere in uh, Spain or Hawaii, sun tanning, not even talking to you. All. But because I'm fat, I'm stays mostly indoors and I'm forced to talk to you all. So, you know, so that's what it is. Have no expectations, very important. Have no expect expectations on the Lama. And if the Lama, uh, when I say we are all at fault, again, I'm not talking about the ones that I have a, uh, uh, mind heart devotion to with one pointed devotion to like Holden Snake Rumbuche, Shadow Rumbuche, and all of them. I'm, I don't include any of them in this, but I'm just saying for us in general, us two goes my generation, all of us, you know, there's so many aspects that we have that are not perfect, that even we have to work on, that we struggle to overcome. And that I find is beautiful because if you don't struggle, you will not understand, you know. Now, say it was there was a period in my life when I went through seven years of being thin, but yet when I saw overweight people struggling to lose weight, I could identify and understand because I've been there, I've been in that situation. And so that's a beautiful thing about being imperfect is these imperfections help you to empathize with the people and you can empathize in so many various ways. You can just take one imperfection and transform that into empathy for a lot of uh, struggles or imperfections that we see in others. Is that the question? Am I going off script again? It's still related, Richard. Hmm? Thank you. <laughs> so that's what it is. So main, my advice to you is don't look for perfection in a Lama because Lamas are not perfect. Don't look for perfection in a Gurus Gurus are not perfect. If it's perfection you seek, it's better you, you venerate the Buddhas, those who've reached the Buddhahood, because we are not Buddhas. Because if we were Buddhas, we wouldn't, I, if I was a Buddha, I'd only, I wouldn't even be here. Why would I be here suffering? No, I'm joking. <laughs> I would come back. I mean, I've taken the vow of the Bodhisattva to come back until all beings are free from suffering and the causes of suffering, but some people are pain in the ass. <laughs> <Whew>. But <laughs> see what I'm saying, uh, jokes aside, don't seek perfection. That is my advice to you. And yes, there are people who are abusive. Yeah, I'm not gonna take any names right now. It is not for me to say, we all, even us, even us as Rinpoche's, we are not exempt from the laws of karma. So when the time comes for us to die, we will also have to deal with the inherited karma, all the actions that we have, whether it's been good or bad, we have to deal with it. Even us, we are not exempt from that. So, but make sure you separate the teacher and the message because the message is stainless. So don't be angry at Guru Yoga, it's stainless. Don't be angry at the teachings of the lineage. Even if that Lama was abusive, whatever he, whatever lineage he may have been in, do not get angry at the lineage or the, or the teachings actually, sorry, not the lineage, but the teachings. Do not, do not get angry at the teachings. Do not lose confidence in the teachings because no way in the teachings does it say that you have to, uh, you, you, you should abuse those who seek refuge. If it says, says it there, then show me, show me. I'm, I'm, I was about to say, I'll give a million dollars, but suddenly if somebody comes up with those teachings, <laughs> I'll be broke. <laughs> but nowhere, as far as I know in the New that's the teachings, does it say in any of the texts, does it say that it's okay to abuse those who come and seek refuge with you? Nowhere does it say. So never, never, never get angry at the teachings. Make sure, as I said before, don't get angry at Guru Yoga get upset at the guru himself. That's his own shortcomings. He, whoever he is, he has to deal with his own karma. Nobody is free. Then any more questions? Uh, so ninth question is, um, can 
Rumisha, can you please um, teach us a brief or informal Guru Yoga for when we don't have time for long sadhanas? Oh, very simple, very simple. This is when you get up, make a point to think of your Guru and just say, Lama, can you? That's all you have to say when you get up. Just say, Lama, can you think of your Guru? That's all you have to do. You don't even have to do that. Oh, this is my experience. Once again, if somebody else says so, otherwise, please follow whatever your teacher says. Please follow their advice. When, when, when you get up, you say, Lama, can no, say, you know, when you eat, offer it and so offer it and say, Lama, can no, you know, think of your Lama, your Guru. When you are going to sleep, think of your Lama, say, Lama, can no, keep on saying, Lama, can no, Lama, can no. And everything that you do throughout the day, let it become a habit. And I, I was saying this to them, you know, so, and then just suppose, and this is how important Guru Yoga is actually. We talk about training and people say, oh, I have gone into deep, uh, poor training. And now my visualized has become perfect. I know all the things that's needed. That's very well and good. But if a bus is going to hit you in 10 seconds, I don't think so you have time to think of any blue or red colors. But if you're doing Guru Yoga every day, every day, you're making it a habit to say, Lama Keno, when you get up, Lama Keno, before you sleep, Lama Keno, when you eat, at least I can tell you that as the bus is about to hit you in 10 or even two se seconds, you will have the presence of mind to say, Lama Keno. And that in itself is what's going to be a game changer, right? And if you're somebody who's mean and moody all the time and you get up with saying, shit, 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 whole day you're going to say, shit, F this, F that, F this. When a bus is about to hit you, what are you going to say? Shit or F. And what's going to happen? You're going to go to the depths of hell. No, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm sure they'll go to save you. But you get my point, right? It's very simple. Think of your guru. Now, I know there's an aversion. I, I, know, I know some people have an aversion to this guru system. If you have an aversion to the guru system, leave the tantric system, leave the Vajrayana. I'm, you have so many choices there, you know, because they cannot be in the Vajrayana without the guru. There is no realization, and that's a simple fact. But doesn't mean you will not gain enlightenment if you go to another, uh, you know, Mahayana or Hinayana. Or, you know, you know this. You have so many options. But for those who have an aversion to the Guru system but still want to practice the Vajrayana, to them also, I say, please go ahead and do it. But uh, for us, we have. I mean, a certain, a lot of confidence in the teachings of, for myself, especially in the teachings of Dinjur Rinpoche. And then there he says so clearly, as I said before, there can be no realization without Guru Yoga. He says that they're very plain and simple. And that's what's important, that there is no realization. Then if you don't want to do Guru Yoga, then I don't know, but why, you, uh, why is anyone even in the Vajrayana? So just like, uh, you know, Muay Thai, boxing, you can't go into a Muay Thai training uh, camp and say, you know, I don't want to kick. I just want to box. No, go to a boxing camp then in that case. Why do you want to go to a Muay Thai camp? You, know? you get my point? If you get it, I just assume that they all also got it. <laughs> so. <laughs> so that's stupid. <laughs> so okay. that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so the last question, um, I guess not a question, but um, do you, do you have anything else you'd like to say before? Haven't I talked enough already? Um, you can just add, I guess, add on top. Add know, on precise. top. What would I like to say? Uh, what I, have the attitude of a bodhi, of a bodhicitta mind. Really have a, I mean, attitude of a bodhisattva, which is bodhicitta. Uh, it's very important. The foundation, never forget the basic foundation of love and compassion. Uh, infused with wisdom, you know, this is very important. So without love and compassion, uh, which essentially is the basis of bodhicitta, there can be nothing. Without that foundation, there is nothing. Some people get lost in the teachings, like I said before, is because they don't really understand or grasp the importance of the basics, basics of being kind, basics of being a decent human being, basic of loving people, but loving people, all people, not just the people we want to love. 
you will know that your practice as holiness Rinpoche, says the sign of a practitioner is also a harmony with others you know the practice of uh, not the practice the result of realization is seeing yourself in others seeing that if you hurt someone else you yourself get hurt if you love someone else you yourself are loved once you can get that realization then you will be able to understand and it's very difficult it's very difficult no no one is asking anyone to be like the buddha that is impossible neither am are we asking anyone to be like his holiness the karma power his holiness the dinkum that is also difficult but what can one do you can aspire to be like them make small changes this is where guru yoga helps when we do guru yoga and our mind mingles with the mind of our guru or from myself with I, I, my mind i assume mingles with hansalas or with dinkum rumba chairs or with champion rumba chairs or with those who tend to know rumba chairs doesn't mean that all of a sudden I'm, I become them. That is presumptuous of me because I will never be even an ounce of who they are. However, practicing Guru Yoga instills in me the want to change, to be a good human being, to see the good in others. That's what it inspires. It's like not just spiritual aspirations, but even basic loving kindness aspirations to love aspirations to to be compassionate you know the aspirations to see that all beings are freed from suffering that's what it ha happens is that's what it does it instills that aspiration in you when you do the guru yoga doesn't mean you know some people may feel defeated they may say oh i did guru yoga but i don't feel like you should oh i did guru yoga i don't feel like guru Mujay. no you shouldn't that's the point you know because if you are Guru Rumbachi and you feel like Guru Rumbachi and you become Guru Rumbachi, then there is no need for Guru Rumbachi at all. But the point here is that's what it is. Make changes, but make change. It'll make changes. Transform yourself. Contemplate. Guru Yoga should make you contemplate. Be honest with yourself. Uh, look at your own shortcomings. See what you can do to be a better human being. You know, to be a decent, decent human being. You don't have to be Mother Teresa, you don't have to be the Dalit Lama, you don't have to be Dinjum Rinpoche. You just need to be a good human being. You know, leave as less uh, footprint of harm and the, being the cause of harm to others and being more of a protector and uh, like a mother to her children, to all sentient beings. If that's what you can do, if that's what becomes your aspirations, then Guru Yoga is working. But if you still, in your heart of heart, you have aversion to some people and things like that, uh, we all human beings will all have that, but uh, the measure of your practice is in how you see others, really honestly, that's what it is. How you treat others is a reflection of where your practice is. That's very important. So the last question. Yeah, um, do you want to open up a Q&A? Oh. Q &A. Q &A, I haven't even eaten dinner. <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone and can any anything else any other questions oh, i just want to say thank you very much Rinpoche. that was really great um yeah i can't add anything at all it would be meaningful thank you thank you so much Dallas. thank you everyone thank you for joining me i'm so sorry if i went off topic sometimes i get carried away it was perfect Rinpoche. thank you all right thank you thank you everyone what, what time is it in Australia, though, just now? Uh, it is 10 past 11 in the morning on Sunday. Oh, oh don't get up that early on Sunday, please. <laughs> you, should, you should be in bed. <laughs> there are some people here from Germany who got up at one in the morning. Oh, my Lord. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. All right. Please take care. Thank you, Rimshay. Thank you so much. Thank you Thank for you. giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Let's do it again. <laughs>